today we're going to be doing an acetylation of salicylic acid. And for this acetylation, we're just going to be running it at relatively low temperature. So we're just going to have a water bath here. We're not going to be really working in the hood. We're going to be working with salicylic acid. I've already weighed a little bit out. Uh, it's a little bit more than 5 grams, 5.047 grams. And we have some acetic anhydride. That's going to be in liquid form. So it's going to be dissolving the salicylic acid and reacting with it. That's what we would call a neat reaction where we don't have any solvent. And we're going to be using a little bit of catalytic sulfuric acid, which is over in the hood. It's uh, 18 molar or concentrated sulfuric acid. We're also going to put some boiling chips in there, and that's going to allow it to uh, prevent any kind of uh, bumping. So it creates a little nucleation site for all the bubbles to form. We're not going to add a stir bar to this reaction. So here's how we're going to get started. We're just going to get uh, our flask. 50 milliliters. We're going to add all of our salicylic acid to this flask. It's often great to put your dry reagents into your flask first before you dissolve them in the solvent or in liquid reagents. Just want to be patient with it. Awesome. Try to get as much of this as you can to maximize your yield, right? Um, so in this case, we're going to be trying to make sure that we get all of this solid out of the neck. So a great way to do that, and then one reason why I use the solvent um, as the second step for putting things into the flask is to wash down everything. So I'm gonna set up this flask, clamp it by the neck always when it comes to any kind of reactions. You don't want to be clamping it by let's say a condenser or something else. It's just not as safe. And we're going to take some of the acetic anhydride and we're going to put that into our graduated cylinder. So we need, in this case, 15 milliliters. Now you want to be really careful with the acetic anhydride and sometimes it's better to work in the hood. Today we're gonna, I'm just gonna work a little quickly, but it's pretty noxious and it can Basically just smells like really, really intense vinegar. This is in excess and so the exact amount of it doesn't matter too much. The salicylic acid is going to be acting as a limiting reagent. So you can use a funnel or just carefully pour this in here. And actually, in order to make sure I get all of that solid, I just want to make sure I get all of it. I'm going to just pour this around the edge. Spilled a little bit of it, that's fine. I'm gonna switch out my glove here. Maybe add another milliliter. One of the risks of using a small neck on your flask is having these kinds of problems. So I'm gonna add, just to compensate for whatever I lost, another one milliliter of, this, of the acetic anhydride. And I'm going to grab a Kim wipe. Try to make sure that I get rid of all of the residue that's inside of this flask before I try to add grease to it because you don't want grease to get stuck with uh, mixed with the, the product or some kind of solid. The reaction, there probably won't be any reactions, but it's just good practice to make sure that the joint is nice and clean. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take this reflux condenser and I'm going to set it up so that water is flowing from the bottom to the top. Never the opposite. You always want to make sure you have the flow going from the bottom to the top because otherwise you'll have bubbles sort of get stuck here in a really weird way. It won't really flow quite right. It just will look totally wrong and it just is not as efficient. It's also nice to have the cold water coming in at the bottom because that'll be most effective at stop, stopping vapors coming up from the flask itself. So um, I'm gonna grease it with a little bit of grease, just enough to cover the surface with a tiny little bit. And you don't want much more than that because it can get into your product and contaminate it. If you're trying to make super clean products, it's not good. And I'm going to slide this into place. 
and just spin it around and make sure that the grease is evenly distributed back and forth. A lot of these techniques can kind of be used for lots of different reflexes, not just this particular reaction. And then I'm going to take one of these tubes, place them on the cooling water valve, place that exact tube in the bottom, or on the bottom of this reflux condenser, where it can freely rotate because it's not clamped. And then I'm going to take the other one that goes to the sink and place it on the top. Sometimes if you don't want to avoid putting pressure on this joint, you can also do this while just holding this reflux condenser. You want to be as gentle as you can on all the glassware and all the glassware joints as, as much as possible. So then we're going to raise up this flask and I'm going to grab some DI water and throw it into this dish to act as a hot water bath. So we're going to attempt to re reflux this for about 20 minutes, but really we just need it to be nice and hot. The reaction will happen even on the reflux, it just won't be quite as fast. And we're going to use water, and water has a maximum boiling point at, uh, let's say, sea level uh, of 100 degrees Celsius. So we are going to set that flask so it's submerged in the water, but not in pressure with the bottom of the dish. You don't want to put too much pressure on the glass if you don't have to. And then it'll be ready to go for the reflux. We just gotta start heating everything up. So we don't need to stir on today, we just need the heat. Then I'm gonna just crank the heat up pretty high until it gets to temperature. And as soon as I usually begin turning on the heat, I usually get the cooling going um, just because it actually is a good practice to never heat anything that's not being cooled. You wanna make sure you, you have the system as controlled as possible. best thing about a good reflex is that it's a well-controlled temperature. Uh, if you have a temperature that's out of control, bad things can happen. You want to keep everything as safe as possible. So what I'm going to do next, and you can do this through the top since boiling stones are small, is I'm just going to add a couple boiling stones. Add here. So I've got four here. I'll just drop them in. And they're just going to be at the bottom of this flask with the product, or sorry, the uh, starting material, the salicylic acid. Um, and they're going to just kind of hang out there. We're going to have to remove them through filtration later. Um, they're, or we can decant off of them. It just There's a lot of ways to get rid of them. They're not going to do too much uh, other stuff than just sitting around in there and uh, creating bubbles. Next, I'm going to take the sulfuric acid and I'm going to add one to two milliliters, which is pretty much the length of a, a pipette full in this pipette. And so, in order to avoid um, potentially wasting some of it on a piece of glassware like a graduated cylinder, and since this is catalytic, the amount doesn't matter too, too much, I'm just going to add it directly from the pipette. That should be about one to two milliliters. and then add directly to the reaction mixture. So once the reflux is set up, if it's set up carefully, it's pretty much well designed for being self-contained and kind of being left alone for, I don't know, as long as you need to go. It could be, you know, 20 minutes. It could be 20 days, really. If, if you do a reflux right, you could potentially leave it uh, alone indefinitely will just recycle solvent as long as you need it to. So for now, we're just going to uh, let it go for about 20 minutes. And I'm going to start the time once it gets a little bit warmer. Once I start to feel this flask get warm or this dish, uh, I'm going to begin the time and uh, may give this a little bit of a stir. So you want to be careful you don't burn yourself. But it's sometimes hard to stir everything inside. So you can always raise the flask 
mix it around manually like this just to get everything moving. Once it begins to boil, it will start to move itself around just by the turbulence of the bubbles alone. All right, 20 minutes we've got and uh, we will see what happens. Okay, so we've had this going for about 20 minutes and it's time to make sure that we uh, let it cool effectively and crystallize before we try to do the workup. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm going to just take my hand and reach back here and lift this up. And then an easy way to cool this down more effectively is to turn off the heat naturally but also to take the flask and put it into a cooled or a colder uh, flask of water where it can cool more effectively. Now you probably don't want to throw this into some ice water, even though it is colder and hypothetically seems like it would be a better choice to cool this quickly. And that's mostly because if you use ice water what could happen is you could actually crack the, the flask, depending on how high quality your flask is, the temperature change could cause problems there. So you want to also leave the condenser on and in place, um, at least for now, just because this will help draw away some of the heat as well. The reaction has been cooling for about 20 minutes and now it's time to add a little bit of water to quench the acetic anhydride that's left over in this flask. Water, when combined with acetic anhydride, forms uh, two equivalents of acetic acid and that's going to be a really exothermic reaction in this case. So we are going to do our best to uh, mitigate that, uh, the danger of that by just slowly adding the water. Uh, specifically the ice cold um, DIY water that I've set aside beforehand. And as I add the, the uh, water, I'm going to just keep an eye on the flask itself. Um, and I'm going to be trickling it through the condenser so I get a little bit of space between me and wherever any kind of gases that might be evolved might be forming. So anytime you're doing a reaction where you're quenching uh, a solution, that is you're adding, let's say you have a really reactive reagent inside of here, maybe a base or an acid, and you're trying to uh, reduce the reactivity of it or um, uh, basically neutralize it, you're going to want to always do that slowly. It's just a good precaution. So I'm just going to add about five milliliters from the wash bottle. Heating up already. Just at the equator of the flask, not actually on the bottom or the top, just right around the surface where that water is hanging out. Appears, ooh, this is quite hot. It appears that uh, the flask has probably, it's not going to be reacting anymore, it's just still sort of exothermic. So we're going to add another 10 milliliters of this water. And I'll just use a wash bottle. Yeah, that was better. And we'll call that good. That's plenty of water to fully neutralize this material. So this is screaming hot, even though it was already pretty much at ice temperature to begin with. And that's because of the exothermic nature of this reaction. So before I dunk it back in the ice, and potentially cause the glass to get stressed out by the big temperature change, I'm going to let it actually sit here cool for a second before I put it back into this ice water and allow it to cool more. By cooling it, you're going to be able to actually precipitate out the product and that will be the crude product which we will then be able to filter out. Alright, so 
it appears that we have fully crystallized our product. Uh, this was going pretty slow, it wasn't really crystallizing very easily, so I added a little bit of uh, acetosalicylic acid, the product, to um, crystallize it out, just a little seed crystal. And that worked great. It actually bloomed right out of solution. It's just practically all product in here. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to take the reflux condenser out, and I'm going to place it to the side. I'm going to set it down gently because these are pretty delicate and I'm gonna turn off this water so that it's not running anymore. I can make sure that this neck of the flask is clean. That is really important because we're gonna be passing all our product through here. And if there's any kind of grease, it's gonna carry over into where we end up putting this stuff. Which is no good, unacceptable. Finally, we have obtained our product. And so it is quite thick in here. There's, you know, there should be quite a bit of um, product, a little bit over maybe five grams. Um, so you'll have to go around, go about figuring out uh, what the theoretical yield of the product is. But uh, quite a bit in here, definitely at least five grams, I, I think. Next, we're gonna to go to the Buechner filter that we've set up over here. And all we gotta do is take this pre-weighed Buechner head and filter paper, which I've already listed. It's about 14.5 grams, 14.6. Um, obviously, I used uh, down to the milligram for, uh, um, for the mass there. And then I'm going to transfer this using a little bit of ice DI water to rinse through this filter and into the uh, flask at the bottom. So I'm gonna flip this on. And anytime you use a Buchner filter, uh, especially a vacuum filter, you always wanna first prime the filter with a little bit of water. And that helps seat the filter to the bottom of the Buchner head. You wanna finesse this a little, you wanna get a little bit of momentum going here and you just transfer as much as you can in one sweep. We're gonna do as many passes as we need to in order to get as much of this product as possible. The big important thing here, if you solvent that's going to be soluble with your product, you are going to potentially pull more of it through and dissolve it into the filtering. That's not what you want. You typically want to go for a cold solvent that is not very soluble with your product to wash and rinse your glassware in order to get the maximum amount of product left at the top as you collect the precipitate. That's your goal. You then want to dry everything off carefully and allow it to sit on the vacuum for long enough to make sure that you get as little water as possible when you go over to the, uh, to the scale and finally weigh out your, your product mass. It's pretty good. I need mean, one more rinse. For each of the portions of liquid you use, you can always rinse the flask where the uh, mixture came from good way to make sure you maximize your yield. It smells very vinegary in here. It's like an Irish or an English pub or something. So this is what we call our crude product. I'm uh, not going to be doing the recrystallization today. But what I will do for you is I'll show you the iron chloride test with some of this product and we can decide whether or not it still contains any kind of phenols or the starting material is acid. And that'll allow us to actually decide whether or not the material needs recrystallization. Sometimes we'll do a reaction and the reaction will work so well that you won't really need recrystallization at all um, because you end up with most of the starting materials being removed and you end up with just really clean product. 
In this case, probably we're gonna need at least a little bit of recrystallization is my guess, but the iron chloride te uh, test will tell us whether there's any of the starting material present and we can know instead of having to just guess, which is always better. So here I have a sample of acetyl salicylic acid, which is our product that we're planning to get. Here we have some salicylic acid, which is our starting material. And here is our crude product, which I picked up from our nuclear filter up here. Just a little bit, won't affect our yield too much. Now I'm going to take a little bit of iron chloride solution in water, and I'm going to add that to each of these test tubes. Let's see how they react. In the presence of a phenol, you would actually see a color change without the phenol you would not. So hopefully this doesn't have any cross-contamination. This should be without a phenol. That's what we are expecting or hoping for. And it appears it just stays the same color that it was in the bottle, which is a light yellow. Next going to take a little bit of this and mix it with the salicylic acid, which is our starting material. As soon as it comes in contact, it turns a dark purple color, which is a sign that you have some kind of fill um, in the presence of this iron chloride. And that means that our starting material had that phenol, which, as we know it does, is salicylic acid. So if we want to know if we have any contamination in our product of our starting material, all we have to do is take a little bit of this iron chloride and do the same test. So as you can see, looks like we definitely have some of our uh, salicylic acid mixed in with our product. There's probably a good amount of the product in there, but one thing that we could do is we could do a recrystallization or maybe column chromatography to separate the two and get the product that we desire instead of just this mixture, which is not any use to us if we want to do good chemistry. And that's all she wrote.